Today what we're going to do is we're going to continue on uh, in our series. Uh, It's a series that we began two weeks ago. The series is called Tools. We're looking at four tools that God gives us uh, for success. Now before we get into that, would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get a chance to step back and to remember that you give us all the tools and the skills necessary to be able to have a life of purpose and of meaning. We pray that today, Father, as we look at how we can have success by focusing on the most important thing. Father, that, uh, that we can have an open heart, open mind to the message, and every single one of us will walk out of here fired up to live the life that you intended and created for us to live. And because of that, Father, we know that we'll make a difference with our life. And again, we just thank you so much for that. And again, Father, we praise our son, Jesus' name. Amen. So if you want to take out your program there out of your, uh, or your teaching notes out of your program there, you see that the series that we are in, again, it's tools, four tools that God gives us uh, for success. And, and the series verse that we're in, and we're going to look at this verse throughout the entire series, is Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. It's right there on your notes. Here's what Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10 says. It says, if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. So there's a lot of wasted energy with a tool that isn't what it needs to be. But then it says, but skill will bring success. See, if we have the right tools and the right skills, that will bring success. And that's what God wants for us, that God wants us to succeed. We have a heavenly father that loves his kids. No good father wants his kids to fail, but God wants us to succeed. But he wants to succeed in the purpose and the intention of what he created our life uh, to be. And so we're talking about how we can focus on those tools and those skills to develop those for success. Now, I don't know if you know uh, this about me, but uh, I used to want to be an NFL football player. Yeah, when I was younger, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be in the NFL. I was a pretty good running back. And so I was like, you know what? That's what, that's what I'm, I'm just going to do that. But then what ended up happening it was the wildest thing. I stopped growing. And so every, all, everyone else started growing around me. And I'm like, man, what is going on? Yeah, these big old linemen. And, and I'm like, this stinks. And then after a while, what ended up happening is I realized that I didn't have a whole lot of skill when I put myself against other people who actually had really good skill. And I realized, oh, maybe I don't have uh, what it takes. So I didn't have this, the, the, the body, the size. I remember in high school, we had a running back that literally had legs that weighed as much as I did, right? He's a big old ham hock of a leg. And he's just muscular, would break right through the line. And I'm like, okay, I'm never going to win the start spot there. And so, so what ended up happening is little by little, I started to understand that the dream of me becoming an NFL football player wasn't going to happen. I still can't believe that the Patriots haven't called me and said, hey, we need you, you know, for, for the season. I don't, I don't know what's going on with that, but uh, I keep sending them, you know, information, but they you know, don't do that. No, but, but here's the thing. The thing is this, is that the reason I won't ever be an NFL football player is I don't have the, the size, I don't have the speed, and I don't have the skill. And I do have physical limitations. I have physical limitations to being an NFL football player. And see, and oftentimes what we do is we believe that in order for us to accomplish God's purpose for our life, we put ourselves and say that maybe we have physical limitations to accomplish the purpose that God has for us, but nothing can be further from the truth. See, when God gives us purpose, not just a selfish, you know, I want to be famous NFL purpose, but when God puts a purpose into our heart and into our life, God gives us the tools and the skills necessary to accomplish that purpose. And so what I want us to do is make sure that we don't apply that principle of maybe I'm just too small. Maybe I'm just, I just can't do that when it comes to God's direction for our life. So we're talking about learning, how we can learn the the tools that God gives us to have success that God intended for us. And so uh, last week we looked, or the last two weeks we looked at the first tool. The first tool was this, that and then skill that we must develop is we need to ignore negative people. That you, this is a skill that you must develop because if you don't develop this skill, there's no way for us to achieve success because negative people will be a part of your life and they'll keep trying to pull you back. And every time you're moving forward and you're looking back at the past, because that's so many what negative people do, right? Negative people will tell you about who you used to be so that you don't move forward into the life that God has called you to be. And so because of that, you keep looking back. Now, let me tell you, if you're driving on the freeway and look, always looking back, you're going to run off the freeway. And that's what happens sometimes to the purpose that God has for our life is that we keep looking back and then we wonder what just happened to my life. So what we have to do is keep looking forward. So today we're going to talk about the second skill that we must develop if we want to have success in our life. And here's the second skill is we must know what matters most. 
We have to develop the skill of defining, distinguishing what matters most. This one here is so important. It is so critical. It is, it is foundational for us to be able to move forward and to have the success that God intended for us. To, to be able to look at a situation, and when you look at a situation, you know what's important and what's not important. You know what's valuable and what's not valuable. You learn what matters and what doesn't matter. Successful people do this. Listen to what it says here uh, in your notes. I put a quote there that successful people recognize what's important and don't worry about what's not. That is so true. Successful people know how to recognize and focus on what's important and the stuff that's not important. They, they, they don't even focus on it. They just keep moving forward on what is now. This is so important to success, but so many of us, so few of us are ever born with this. I want you to know this, that this type of focus, that few people are born with it, this is a skill that is developed. And so God gives us the tools to develop this skill of understanding what matters most. To focus on that one thing. That the Apostle Paul said it the best, and you can write this verse down, it's not there in your notes. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, where he says there, this is the one thing I do, the one thing I do, I forget what's behind and I press forward to what's ahead so that I may reach the upward call of Christ. He says, I do one thing. I focus on the most important thing. I'm not going to focus on 40 different things. I'm not going to be spread so thin because let's admit that's what we do. Oftentimes the reason we can't accomplish and we feel like we haven't reached our goal for life is because we spread ourselves so thin. But the apostle Paul says, I'm not going to spread myself so thin. I'm not looking at 40 different things. I'm having laser focus on what's important. I'm going to make sure that's the direction I keep moving forward. And I promise you this, that if we learn to be laser focused on what's important, it'll change our life. It'll change our home. It'll change our families. It'll change the, 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 the way we look at work. It will literally bring success in those areas when it's all focusing on what's important. I guarantee that a lot of us can say this, that when things fell apart, especially something that was extremely important, it's because someone wasn't focused on what was important. But when we focus on it, that will be, then succeed. See, I'm going to tell you a secret. And it's not really a secret. You already know this. But when it comes to life, we don't have the time to do everything that is put in front of us. None of us do. And, and oftentimes we want to do everything. And so there are going to be times in your life when you have to say no to the good to stay focused on the great. And this is a, this is a, a skill I'm learning. I, I'm, I have not mastered this one down because I hate letting people down. So because of that, I, I always say yes. And here's what I found myself is I said, yes, here, say yes, there, say yes, there, say yes, there. And what I find myself doing sometimes is I get a whole lot of things started, but I don't get a lot of things finished because of being spread so thin. So what I'm learning to do is no to the good so I can stay focused and say yes to the great, what God wants me to do. You see, God never expected us to do everything in life. Oftentimes people believe that. Oftentimes people believe that if something was put in front of you, it must have been from God, therefore I must do. We don't realize that sometimes the enemy will put something that looks good to get us distracted from the great that God has for our life. Now, listen to what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It's right there in your notes. It says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything but I will not be mastered by anything. It says, I have the right to do anything. But at the last part there, it says, I will not be mastered by anything. It's saying this. It's saying, don't let things control you. Don't let situations control you. You control them. Don't be a product of everything that gets put into your life. You control what you allow to be a part of your life. And then the first part it said there, it says, I can do anything I want. It says, but not everything is beneficial that you literally have the freedom to do whatever you want. You know that God is such a gentleman. He'll never force himself on you that God allows you. He gave us this incredible, powerful thing in our life called free will. And through free will, God allows us to choose, but he says there, but be careful how you choose because not everything that you choose is beneficial. Not everything in your life you should do. I mean, do you have the right to do it? Yes, but not everything you need to choose to not do it because it's not going to lead you in the right direction. Do you know that every single one of us, we have the right to waste our life? We really do. We can waste it or we can invest it. We can just make bad choices that go, take us in the wrong direction or we can make great choices that lead us to what God intended for, for our life in the first place. See, too often what we do is we waste moments because we focus on the wrong thing. 
You know, this is a very common thing. For us not to be focused on what matters most, we lose moments. And it's not until later on that you realize you lost the moment. You know, for example, there are so many times where people, they're so focused on other stuff that they forget to focus on the things that are important to them. They're focused on, on climbing the ladder of success. And they get to the top of the ladder of success only to realize that there's no one there to share the victory with them because they lost their family in, through the process. A lot of them don't even know themselves anymore because they lost who they were because they just fit to the mold to try to succeed within that organization. A lot of times we miss out on moments because when the kids are home, instead of just spending time with them, hanging out with them, let them have crazy, messy fun and just enjoying that with them, letting them paint your nails. Yes, dads, if you have a daughter, she's gonna wanna do that, just so you know that. But instead, we get so caught up with all the busy and all the busy and all this and all that that we forget that we'll never get those moments back. See, we need to learn to focus on what matters most. And here's the key. The key to that is this. The key is to picking the right things. And the great thing is God gives us a priority list on how to pick the right things so that at the end of your life, you can say that you lived a life with no regrets. It's right there in your notes. A Christian's priority list. Listen to what it says here. It says this. Number one, the top of the priority list. This should be top of everybody. If you've given your life to God, top of the priority list says this. Things God wants me to do. That's number one, that when you focus on things in your life, and if you're going to live out God's purpose for your life, you have to focus on the things that God wants you to do. The, number, the second thing then is this. You then focus on things people I love need me to do. I noticed that word, needs me to do, not necessarily wants me to do, because they, they might need you to do this, but they're going to want you to do something else. Because let's admit, there are times, because the people that are closest to us, they're flawed people. We are all flawed. And sometimes what they want us to do is not what we need to do. So what we focus is on what they need to do. The third thing we then focus on is things I want to do. You know, it's okay to want things. Too often people believe that if you're a Christian, you have to give up your life and it's all about everything, everything for everyone else, everything for everyone else and that, that you can't even enjoy your life anymore. But the Bible tells us that God gives us all good things for our enjoyment. That as a good father, he wants us to enjoy our life, that we can ask of God things for ourselves, that you really can do things that you really want to do. And then the fourth and final thing, this is at the bottom of the priority list, is this, the things that everyone else wants me to do. See, now then you can focus on what do other people need me to do. Now, here's the wild thing, though, is that if we're honest, too often in life, that list is upside down. Too often in life, we allow the main priority of our life to be what everyone else wants me to do. And then what ends up happening is then we go, okay, I'm doing what everybody else, what the world wants me to do, what my job wants me to do, all the other stuff. And then we go, okay, but I deserve some time to myself. So then you do what you want to do. See, you, you, you get so busy by the world. You then go, but well, this is what I want to do. I, I deserve this, right? Too often we, that's what we say, like we deserve this. So then we do what we want to do. And then we have no time to help our family with what they need us to do. And then God just becomes a deity that we believe in, not a father we have a relationship with because we get so distracted by those things. You see, what we have to do is make sure we keep that right side up. Because here's the thing. When God is the number one thing in your life, everything else falls in place. See, the reason, I, when I treat my kids the way they need to be treated, when I, when I treat my wife you know, the way she needs to be treated, that happens because God is the top of my priority list. Because I don't want to uh, let him down. Because I got to tell you, there will be times in your life when you don't want to do the right thing to, for, for the people that are closest to you. There will be times when you want to be selfish. It's about what you want. But when you have the right priority, say, God, I want to make sure I'm, I'm making you proud. Everything lines up the right way. And that's where our life can have the peace that God intended for us. You see, what we're talking about is this, is that knowing what matters most is really knowing what we value. And what we value determines our values, our morals, what we give our life to. And let me show you here. I put something in your note there, a, a quote. It says, our values in life determine our stress, our success, and our salvation. Do you know that? That what you value can determine, not just today, but determines what's happened for eternity. That what your values, you, what you value is what you'll succeed in. So make sure that you value something that you should succeed in. Too often people value something and then once they succeed, they realize, why did I want this in the first place? And this stress, the stress, you know that too often what we do is that because we value so much of what the world thinks and what everybody else wants us to do, 
that it adds so much more stress. And here's the reason. Because what we do is we give ourselves so much to things that don't really matter. But then we look at our life and we realize that we're falling short in what does matter. And that just adds a whole lot of stress and you feel like a failure. This is why people, when they climb the ladder of success, they still feel like a failure because they realize they lost the most important thing. They lost the life that God wanted for them. So, so that's the key is understanding our values. Now, so the thing is this, is that if our values determine our life and determine the direction of our life, then what we want to do is make sure that we can evaluate our values. Evaluate where do our values come from? So what we're going to do is this. We're going to, we're going to look at four questions over this week and next week. Today we're going to do question number one. Next week we'll look, look at the next questions. But we're going to look at four questions to evaluate our values, to know where are my values? Are my values in the right place? And so the first question that we're going to ask ourselves this week Next week, we'll get into the other two, three. It says this, who's going to be my authority? Question number one, who is going to be my authority? This here is a fundamental question. Who's going to be the one that gives you your values? Who's going to be the one that gives you your morals? Because let's admit right now, you know, where you get your values from, there's so many things out there today uh, for the source of values. I mean, you can see it everywhere. You know, the, what we value, a lot of it has been handed to us. A lot of th times, the reason we value certain things is because someone handed something to us, like our, our parents. Our parents are a big way that we receive our value system. Now, that's good if you have great parents and parents that did it right. But if you had parents that didn't do it right, now you know why you're all jacked up. I know, hey, I'm there. I got it. I got it. I have to re reboot all my values. And so, so that's the thing is this, is that, is that uh, our values sometimes come from our parents. But then the other thing is this, is our peers, you know that the people you hang out with, your friends, your coworkers, your you know, classmates, people that you hang out with regularly will actually sway your values. You know that? Uh, too often, you'll find yourself doing things and thinking things that you would have never thought or, or, or done, but you're doing it. Why? Because people around you are, are doing it. It's amazing how that happens. Television is a big way that people get their values. They watch things on TV. I mean, books. Books, a huge way. They read lots of books, and that's going to set my values. But the biggest way today that people get their values is media. You know that? The media. Watching the news, whether it's TV, whether it's the radio, or now, what's huge over the last 5, 10 years, social media. It's incredible how people are setting their values on something that someone put out there in social media. And oftentimes, they don't even evaluate if it's really true. But somebody put it out there, so hey, it must be true. And so what they'll do is they just go, okay, they take it as, as truth and they believe it. But I want you to know something. That, that if we decide to make uh, our value, the source of our value, a poor source, we're going to have poor outcomes. That, that whatever you get your value from determines the direction of your life and the quality of your life. So it's so important for us to understand where should we get our values from? And so we're going to look right now at three different places, three places that people today get their values from. And just so you know that this study, if you ever want to nerd out with me, this study is actually called cultural apologetics, which really what it defines is the value of God, you know, in our life, in our everyday life and how we can know that uh, we need God in our life. So it's an amazing, amazing study. If you want to do that, it's actually taught in seminary, but so I'm going to show you right now, the three different things, three different ways that people receive value today. All right. So the first one is this, all right. Who's going to be my authority. Maybe some people say option number one, I'm going to be my own authority. It'll be three people, me, myself, and I, all right? So, so you know, I'm going to follow my own value system. I'm going to follow my gut. And I've seen people do this. Well, they're going to just do what they feel and, and they feel good about it. So they're going to go ahead and go and do it. They never research it. They just go and do this. I got to tell you, when I've seen people do this, they hit a dead end pretty quickly because they feel like it's the right thing to do. They then do it. And then they realize, oh my goodness, that was not the right thing to do. And things did not work out as planned. Now, here's the reason for that. The reason for that is that, is that all of us are broken. All of us have this issue. Listen to this issue that God tells us about here in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine. It says this, if we're going to get the value from ourselves, know this about ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, let me go ahead and tell you what that verse says. Now, when it says that the heart, the heart is the actual Hebrew word lave, lave, which means the thoughts and intentions of the heart and mind. It says that what we think about inside, that it is deceitful. Now, the word deceitful, the dictionary term of that literally means to mislead and take in the wrong direction. So it says here that our mind can literally mislead us 
and take us in the wrong direction. And our mind does this. Who here has ever done something dumb? Yeah? Everybody raise your hand. Because if you did not raise your hand right now, we're going to talk about lying next week. Right? (laughs) Every single one of us, we've all done something where we thought it was the right thing to do. We thought it was going to be okay. And then the next thing we know, we end up in a world of hurt. And that's what happens. See, too often we convince ourselves that something's okay or that we can do that thing. Our mind lies to us. I want you to know that. My mind lies to me all the time. I, there are times where I said, you know what? I still have the physical ability to do the same things I used to do back in my 20s. You know, my son, Christian, he's extremely, extremely active, strong. I mean, he's, he's a little guy, but man, he is strong. And he, he can do flips and does all kinds of stuff. He's doing, he can do a bunch of push-ups. And, and uh, a few weeks ago, he said that he, wanted, he was going to do one-arm push-ups, right? And so he's doing, working out. I'm like, I can do one-arm push-ups. And he's like, Dad, no, no, it's okay. And I'm like, I'm going to do this. Are you kidding me? Now, I used to be able to do a lot of one-arm push-ups. And so I was like, I'm going to do this thing. I kid you not. I went down and all you hear my back is crack, 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 crack. And the next thing I try to do, I try to go up again. Boom. I was like, oh, oh, rib was out. That's it. Rib was just sticking out of my back. I'm like, oh, I, you know, the next thing I know I am laid up. I had to go on my roller to try to put my rib back in. It was horrible. Now what's wild is this, is that my mind told me, yes, you can. My body said, no, you can't. You are old. And I have to tell you, I beat up my body through sports and stuff. I got broken bones. I got knees that torn meniscuses. And uh, yeah, I'm all beat up. But here's the thing. My mind says, yes, you can still do it. Do you know that our mind actually lies to us? If you read uh, uh, science journals, I encourage you to do this, okay? Go to Google and type in science journal, the mind lies. Science journal, the mind lies. You're going to see there are so many science journals about the mind and how it lies to us. It's incredible. Here's what it says. It says that the mind will literally lie to you. Your mind, your own mind will lie to you. And the way it does that is this, is that it makes decisions based on perception, not on reality. That there will be times when, when you, you, you see something, but what you see is not just objective truth. You're seeing it from your lens of your past. And therefore, you you see it warped. There are times when we look at our spouse in a whole different light and we think negatively, why? It's not because they did something wrong. It's because we're looking at them from the perspective of what's broken back there. And so our own mind can lie to us. I mean, so we have to be so careful. I mean, science has said this happens. I mean, you will tell yourself something that is not true. I've actually heard people say this. There's people that are incredibly fit, incredibly fit. And a lady will say, you know what? I'm so fat. And you're like, are you kidding me? I ate a cheeseburger heavier than you. I mean, what are you talking about? But yet in their mind, they're telling themselves, they're telling themselves that that's how they are, but it's not the truth. This is why in a court of law, in a court of law, you, you'll see that when you have multiple witnesses, that they all saw it a little different, that you can have the exact same accident right in the middle of the street and on all four corners, you got four different people. And when they go to court, all four people will have some similarities, but they're going to have a lot of things that are all really different. And so what, what, what the, the judge knows to do, what the, what the lawyers know to do is to focus on the main points because there will be a lot of things that are, that are subjective, not just objective. See, our mind will lie to us. So if our mind lies to us, we know that it cannot be reliable for in ourselves, our gut, to be where we get our value system from. Because we can trick ourselves to believing something is right when it really is not. We misjudge all the time. Listen to what it says here in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. In Proverbs 16, 25, it says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. See, there's a way that seems right to him. In his mind, he's convinced himself. In his heart, he believes this is the right way to go. But in the end, it leads you away from God and God's direction for your life. See, we can convince ourselves of that. It says, don't fool yourself. So we need something bigger, something outside of us to be where we get our value system from. So let's look at the first one, which is the one that most people look at today, where they get their value system. And that that is option number two. Option number two, and I'm going to show you how this is a flawed option, which is the world. A lot of people get their values, but they focus on what's most important in their life by what the world says. And this is the most often one. Because if the world says that's important, if the world says that is cool, if the world says that that is valuable, then what happens is we tend to believe that and go, okay, well, that must be important. That must be what, what cool is. And that must be what, um, what's valuable. It's incredible. And it changes regularly. I, I kid you not. Back in the day, bell bottoms were popular. Yes, they were. So I mean, back in the day when I was in high school, 
That was back when you wore the baggy pants, you know, MC Hammer. You know, talking about the crotch was like way down here. You know, you're like, you look like a little elf. You know, I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, so what happens is this, is that that's always changing. And what we don't bother to do is that when, some, when the world says this is important, this is valuable, people don't bother to ask themselves, why is it important and valuable? See, that, that comes with age. Later on in age, what you do is the reason you don't just conform to everything the world says is like the most hip, cool thing is because you go, why? Why? But see, that comes later on with maturity. See, we, need, we live in a world that just takes it at face value. And the world has some messed up values. Listen to what it says here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And just so you know, this was written thousands of years ago, all right, or 2,000 years ago. This could have been written today and as we look at the value system of the world. Listen to what it says. It says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Anyone who loves the world, and it's talking about the values of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, here's, here it goes on to describe the values of the world. Okay, what the world sees as important. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. See, it gave us three different things here, three different values that the world holds so high. And I think we would all agree with this. Those are so true today. Those are so true today. You know, I gave you all three of them right there in your notes. It says they're pleasure, vanity, and materialism. That, that, that it's all about feeling good, looking good, and having goods. That that's what the world literally values today. And we can see that in culture. We can see that in pop culture is huge. I mean, look at uh, all the songs that are out there. You, I mean, almost, you walk, watch any music video or whatever, they're, they're making it rain. Every single one, right? And, and too often we go, yeah, kids. Come on, let's admit Snoop Dogg was making it rain way back in the day when we were younger too, right? You know, uh, and so, so the thing is this, is that this has been around. Pop culture has been like this for so long. It's crazy. If you go back and listen to some of the songs that were around back, you know, I, I go back to look at the 80s and 90s, and you look at the lyrics, you're like, oh, my goodness. I'm surprised I was allowed to listen to that. It's crazy what, you know, what's there. But because you can see these three things. So let's look at these three things that the world says are valuable. I'm going to show you how they don't hold value. They don't hold ultimate value. Number one, pleasure. Pleasure. Where it says there, uh, the, the, the lust of the flesh. This is saying here that it's better to feel good than to do good. That's what the world says. The world says that it's more about feeling good than actually doing good. Because doing good, doing the right thing, I tell you, it means you're going to have to face situations where it aren't going to feel very good. But that's what a hero is. A hero does the, the harder right. But the world loves to just feel good. You know that right now, one of the biggest uh, uh, you know, organizations, companies that are out there or, uh, um, is entertainment. Not, not companies, but uh, where they're making the most money is entertainment. Entertainment. You know why? Because all people care about is feeling good. As long as you entertain them, they feel good, they'll keep dishing out money. It's one of the most lucrative things that you can get into is entertainment. You know, but the other thing is this, is when it's talking about the lust of the flesh, it's also talking about sex. That sex dominates our society. Can we, can we agree with that? It dominates. It's always dominated. I mean, this was written 2,000 years ago. You can see even before that in the Old Testament, sex dominated societies. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, back when we were younger, sex dominated societies. It's, it's incredible. See, all the stuff that was around when we were younger, it's around today. It's just more easily accessible today. See, before you had to go and buy a magazine. Now you can just pop open an internet browser. I mean, it's insane, but it's all the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. Today, sex sells things. You know that? Isn't it crazy? I mean, think about this. You, you could turn on the TV, you could see a commercial, and the commercial could literally be for like spark plugs. And there's a girl in a bathing suit changing the spark plug. You're like, that doesn't happen. That's insane. It could be dish soap, and all she has is like a bathing suit and gloves. Yeah, right. You know, it, it, I mean, seriously, it could be a cheeseburger. Carl's Jr. commercials. I mean, it has the girls, they're all in a bass suit, and it, it's all dripping down their arm. It, come on, come on. But see, the problem is this. People keep buying it. And they go and buy the products. Why? Because it was memorable. Why? Because sex dominates. So, so you have to understand that that's what it's talking about here. The next thing is this. That's talking about the lust of the flesh. It's been around for a long time. The next thing is vanity. Vanity. When it says they're the lust of the eyes. It's talking, talking about appearance. Now, please understand. This doesn't mean that you can't look good. 
You know, there's billions spent in plastic surgery. Now, there's nothing wrong with plastic surgery. There's, there really isn't. There's nothing in the Bible that says plastic surgery is a sin. Nothing in there. The problem lies in this, is that when we, be, we believe less of ourselves unless we get it. When our value for self is based on our beauty, on what we look like, that's where the problem lies. Because the world says this, that as long as you're beautiful, you're more valuable. But what we have to focus on is this. God says your beauty is far more than the outside. Your beauty is on the inside. Because I got to tell you, the outside, no matter how beautiful you are, outside is going to fail at some point. I am proof of that. Right here on this area, right here. No, no, but seriously, the outside will fail for all of us. So God wants us to focus on the inner beauty as well. That's more important. And the last thing there was the pride of life, the boastful pride of life. That's actually just talking about, you know, uh, materialism. That when we boast, that we are arrogant about the things that we have. And it's, when it's talking about boasting, it's talking about showing it off. Showing off, showing off the stuff that we have. You know, it's talking about money and riches and prosperity that we show that off. And that too often in today's society, let's admit, we, we tie self-worth with net worth. That, that as long as we have money in our account, and the more money we have in our account, the more our voice should be heard, which nothing can be further than the truth. Because there are people who will have a lot of money in their account that their voice should just be quiet. There's, a, there's people who have made a whole lot of money that have put, brought a whole lot of destruction. Hugh Hefner. He's got a ton of money, but what he brought to our society wasn't a positive thing. And so, so that's the thing is this, is that we have to get away from, the, from those three things that, that try to distract us. Now, let's admit, that's what our world does. It's all about feeling good, looking good, and having the goods. But all that stuff, I want you to know, will all disappear someday. So what doesn't disappear? The third and final option on where we get our values. And that is God and his word. God and his word. Let me read for you here, John 8, 31 and 32. This is Jesus talking. Here's what Jesus says. If you obey my teachings, talk about my word, what Jesus said. If you obey the, what Jesus said, you are really my disciples. You are truly followers of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That word to be set free means to be unleashed. That's actually, this is the verse that we got our, that we named our church after. Because Jesus Christ did not come to bind us. He came to set us free to live the life that God intended for us to live. To live a life of hope and of purpose and of meaning. So that's what Jesus wants for us. And I love this because the direction that God gives us in his word, through the teachings of Jesus Christ, we see that it is objective truth. It's not subjective. It is objective. And it came to free us. Now think about that. Because if you step back and look at what God says about those things that the world values, let me show you what God says about all three of those things. If you want to write these verses down. The first one, here's what God says about just pleasure. Think, making pleasure your value system, like the world says. Here in Hebrews 11, uh, verses 24 and 25, it says this. It says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God. He chose rather to do the tougher right than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. See, some of people say, sin is not fun. Sin, sin is not pleasurable. You're doing it wrong. Because it is. I want you to know that. That's how Satan gets you. That's how Satan gets you. See, the, now, sin is fun. The consequence of sin is not. Remember, Satan's a fisherman. He throws a lure out. That lure looks good. But he wants you to bite so that later on you're in the frying pan. See, that's how Satan works. And so you have to understand that sin, the pleasure is there momentarily. But you deal with the consequence for a long time. And God says, why don't you do the right thing right now so you can live with the pleasure for a long time? That's how God's truth works. The, the second one is this, is vanity, just appearance. This is what it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. As God was going to pick the next king to take over Saul, and, um, and he's talking about Eliab, uh, Dave, King David's brother, it says this. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance, talking about Eliab's. Because he was a strong, big, good-looking guy. It says, or at the height of his stature. Because I have rejected him. For God sees, not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks at what really matters most. And the last one here, what God says about materialism, just the stuff of life. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus said this. It says, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard for all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. It says, life is more than the stuff that you have. Your life is not measured by what you own. 
And what he's saying here is this, is that the greatest things in life aren't things. So he's trying to help us to focus on what's important. And I want you to know something, that God wants to lead us and give us a life of hope, of meaning, of purpose, a life that makes a difference. He wants us to have a great life. Listen to what it says here in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I love this. It says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways. What your ways? All your ways. Acknowledge him. Follow what God says and he will make your paths straight. That you don't have to be confused about whether you're coming or going. God will show you your next step. And your next step is for success. He wants to not have you be confused. He wants you to keep moving forward. God wants to bless your life. You notice it said there, the path will be made straight. He says he'll give you clear direction. See, that's what a good father wants for his kids. And I want you to know that's what God wants for each and every single one of us. He says, I didn't come to muddy the water. I came to clear it up. So yet you can keep moving forward. Now listen, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the biggest thing I want you to walk out of here today with is this, is know this, that God loves you and God wants to lead you and the direction that he wants to lead your life is not for your harm, it's for your good. I mean, God created you on purpose and for a purpose and he wants you to have hope and meaning and he says that the way this all happens is by allowing him to be your life. Allowing him to, under, to, for you to see how valuable you are to him. If you ever want to know how valuable you are, because we're talking about values, through the cross, God said you're to die for. That's how valuable you are. Listen, God wants to give you the life that he intended for you to have, but it all starts with you. First of all, like that verse said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Maybe you've never trusted God before and you're ready to take that step of faith today. If that's you during this last song, please come over to the Red Connections table. I will be back there uh, during the song. Just head on over there. I want to help you and talk to you about what it means to take your next step in your relationship with God. Would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get the chance to step back and to really understand what we value. Father, what we value, what's most important is so key for success. Father, helping us to, to stay focused on what matters most. Too often what we do is we allow the stuff of life, the things that are irrelevant, that, that we shouldn't be focusing on, Father. We allow those things to be the most important priorities, and then we step back and realize that we're dropping the ball on the things that matter most. I pray, Father, that today we can walk out of here focused. Focus on what matters most. Focus on our relationship with you. Focus, Father, on the things we need to do for our loved ones. And then we take care of everything else. Father, thank you so much that Jesus Christ came to pay the price for our sin. Because you, want, you wanted to show us that we matter to you. We thank you for that. And again, Father, help us to make you proud in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.